we hold these truths to be self-evident. All men and women created by the go, you know the you know the thing. Yeah, hell yeah! Hell yeah! Another atheist ally of Karl Marx was Mikhail Michael Bakunin, 1814 to 1876, a Russian atheist and revolutionary socialist anarchist, and every bit the wild man. The two would later split, but they first met in Paris in the early 1840s and hit it off. We saw each other often, wrote Bakunin, for I greatly respected him for his learning and for his passionate and serious devotion to the cause of the proletariat. I eagerly sought his conversation. When he first met Marx, Bakunin said that Marx was already an atheist, an instructed materialist, and a conscious socialist. Bakunin said that because of their temperaments, there was no frank intimacy among them. They would later become adversaries, as was typical for Marx, and just about everyone he eventually could not stand. Marx flung his usual vitriol at Bakunin, and Bakunin rightly denounced Marx's habitual weapon, a heap of filth. Bile aside, the essence of Marx's intellectual departure from Bakunin was probably valid. Marx surely found it hard to reconcile how one could be a socialist and an anarchist, given that socialism champions the state and anarchy undermines the state. And yet, there are crucial similarities between Marx wanting to ruthlessly criticize everything that exists and Bakunin likewise lashing out at all authority, whether the authority of God, the church, the factory owner, the state, etc., Still, by the time of the first Internationale in the 1870s, decades after they first met, Marx was eviscerating Bakunin as a buffoon. Nonetheless, Marx and Bakunin knew each other well. This is not the place to lay out all of Bakunin's thinking, but it is worth taking a few paragraphs to look at some of the halting sections of his best-known work, God and the State, published in 1871. The sentiments there very much reflect Marx's thinking about religion. Bakunin began the book with a very Marxist sentiment. Yes, the whole history of humanity, intellectual and moral, political and social, is but a reflection of its economic history. Marx would applaud that totally, as he would Bakunin's opiate-like caricature of religion. Maybe Bakunin's worst and most well-known phrase about God and religion is this one from God and the State. If God really existed, it would be necessary to abolish him. Yes, you heard that right. If God really existed, it would be necessary to abolish him. Bakunin had a nasty, angry, cynical view of God and religion, stating that religion enslaves, debases, and corrupts, and that all religions are cruel, all founded on blood. Curiously, however, he was not so nasty, angry, and cynical towards Satan, who he hailed as the eternal rebel, the first free thinker, and the emancipator of worlds. This glorious rebel view of Satan is not unusual among certain radical socialists. As we shall see later in this book, this was how Saul Alinsky framed Satan as well, namely, as the very first radical who rebelled against the establishment. That larger passage in Bakunin's God and the State is worth quoting at length for a fuller idea of where this anarchist socialist friend of Marx stood. Listen to it carefully sentence after sentence, and prepare to be shocked. Yes, our first ancestors, our Adams and our Eves, were, if not gorillas, very near relatives of gorillas, omnivorous, intelligent, and ferocious beasts, endowed in a higher degree than the animals of another species with two precious faculties, the power to think and the desire to rebel. The Bible which is a very interesting and here and there very profound book, when considered as one of the oldest surviving manifestations of human wisdom and fancy, expresses this truth very naively in its myth of original sin. Jehovah, who of all the gods adored by men, was certainly the most jealous, the most vain, the most ferocious, the most unjust, the most bloodthirsty, the most despotic, and the most hostile to human dignity and liberty. Jehovah had just created Adam and Eve to satisfy we know not what caprice, no doubt to while away his time, which must weigh heavy on his hands in his eternal egoistic solitude, or that he might have some new slaves. He generously placed at their disposal the whole earth, with all its fruits and animals, and set but a single limit to this complete enjoyment. He expressly forbade them from touching the fruit of the tree of knowledge. 
He wished, therefore, that man, destitute of all understanding of himself, should remain an eternal beast, ever on all fours, before the eternal God, his creator and master. But here steps in Satan, the eternal rebel, the first freethinker and the emancipator of worlds. He makes man ashamed of his bestial innocence and obedience. He emancipates him, stamps upon his brow the seal of liberty and humanity, in urging him to disobey and eat of the fruit of knowledge. Again, here we see Bakunin's good Satan, a free thinker. Such was a high compliment in the late 19th century and into the early 20th century, as free thinkers were in vogue among the progressive left. This commendable Satan is the great emancipator. Bakunin continued decrying the role of the great spoiler, God. He narrates, characterizing the good God as, well, not exactly so. We know what followed. The good God, whose foresight, which is one of the divine faculties, should have warned him, Satan, of what would happen, flew into a terrible and ridiculous rage. He cursed Satan, man, and the world created by himself, striking himself, so to speak, in his own creation, as children do when they get angry, and not content with smiting our ancestors themselves, he cursed them in all the generations to come, innocent of the crime committed by their forefathers. Our Catholic and Protestant theologians look upon that as very profound and very just, precisely because it is monstrously iniquitous and absurd. Then, remembering that he was not only a god of vengeance and wrath, but also a god of love, after having tormented the existence of a few milliards of poor human beings and condemned them to an eternal hell, he took pity on the rest, and to save them and reconcile his eternal and divine love with his eternal and divine anger, always greedy for victims and blood, he sent into the world, as an expiatory victim, his only son, that he might be killed by men. That is called the mystery of the redemption, the basis of all the Christian religions. Still, if the divine Savior had saved the human world, but no, in the paradise promised by Christ, as we know, such being the formal announcement, the elect will number very few. The rest, the immense majority of the generations present and to come, will burn eternally in hell. In the meantime, to console us, God, ever just, ever good, hands over the earth to the government of the Napoleon Thirds, of the William First, of the Ferdinands of Austria, and of the Alexanders of all the Russias. Such are the absurd tales that are told and the monstrous doctrines that are taught in the full light of the 19th century, in all the public schools of Europe, at the express command of the government. They call this civilizing the people. Is it not plain that all these governments are systematic poisoners, interested stupefiers of the masses? This lengthy, appalling passage from Mikhail Bakunin speaks for itself. It requires no commentary other than to perhaps note that surely Karl Marx grinned an impish grin as he read it. Actually, one more comment seems due. Bakunin better have hoped to all hope that he was right. Otherwise, he was destined to face a mighty reckoning some day in the afterlife. That is, as he faced and dealt with in his words this most jealous, most vain, most ferocious, most unjust, most bloodthirsty, most despotic, most hostile to human dignity and liberty, eternally egoistic, Jehovah. From there, Bakunin's rant continued, with the anarchist, socialist, atheist, revolutionary himself aware of his own ranting. I have wandered from my subject, because anger gets hold of me whenever I think of the base and criminal means which they employ to keep the nations in perpetual slavery, undoubtedly that they may be the better able to fleece them. Of what consequence are the crimes of all the Tropmans in the world compared with this crime of treason against humanity committed daily, in broad day, over the whole surface of the civilized world, by those who dare to call themselves the guardians and the fathers of the people? I return to the myth of original sin. God admitted that Satan was right. 
He recognized that the devil did not deceive Adam and Eve in promising them knowledge and liberty as a reward for the act of disobedience which he had induced them to commit. For, immediately they had eaten of the forbidden fruit, God himself said, see Bible, Behold, man is become as one of the gods, knowing both good and evil. Prevent him, therefore, from eating of the fruit of eternal life, lest he become immortal like ourselves. Let us disregard now the fabulous portion of this myth and consider its true meaning, which is very clear. Man has emancipated himself. He has separated himself from animality and constituted himself a man. He has begun his distinctively human history and development by an act of disobedience and science, that is, by rebellion and by thought. Bakunin's opus runs on like this, with page after page of such prideful bilge. He asserted, All religions, with their gods, their demigods, and their prophets, their messiahs, and their saints, were created by the credulous fancy of men who had not attained the full development and full possession of their faculties. Thus he insisted, the religious heaven is nothing but a mirage created by man, exalted by ignorance and faith. This is fully consistent with Karl Marx's view that man makes religion. Again, this was from one of Marx's early admirers. No doubt Marx's admirers today in the academy will be quick to rush to his defense and remind us that he and Bakunin became foes, or at least Bakunin became a rival in Marx's eyes. Yes, that is correct. But Marx's disapproval of Bakunin was not for any religious reason or disagreement. As for the words of Bakunin quoted here, Marx would have surely extended a warm smile and generous appreciation. Few appreciated a good rant against religion, quite like Karl Marx.